All right. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, um, I will try to guide you through some of the notes concerning use of the AI in the manufacturing industry. And just before I will start, um, I'll get philosophical, but just for, for one slide. Um, I believe that the effect of the intelligent machines as they are being developed is uh, already providing a profound utility. That the effect in developing of these is uh, uh, making a big change even though we are not there yet. So as a matter of fact, we don't have intelligent machines as such. But let's liken the pursuit of the intelligent machines to space exploration or electrification or changes like that. And all of these are typical for not just meeting the purpose they've been designed for and they, their original intention, but also having lots of side effects, lots of spin-offs and development in other areas. And I have listed just uh, some of those on the, on the right side. So even though, even if we don't get down to the goal of actually making an intelligent machines, we already have a profound effect that is of immense utilization. It has been said quite a few times during the morning uh, that we are building models. And let's not forget, forget about that. The modeling itself has its rules, it has its drawbacks, and actually modeling is the only way we have to understand the world around. If we want to understand anything about the world, we are building a model of it, and then we use that model to learn about the world. And these models can be, the, the most frequent type is the, uh, is the mental model. We just think about what is happening. And that's or, that already deviates from the reality. Another type would be, let's make, it, let's make a physical model of that thing. Okay, and that is another great utility we can, we can have. And then we go down to the realm of mathematics, really, building analytical models. And I would like to make the distinction between analyt analytical and numerical ones. Um, the analytical would be those that provide a continuous output space. So we have a model, for example, whatever, heat transfer or something like that. And it is typical that there is not just one point this uh, model provides. It is a range, a continuous spectrum of points, continuous space of, uh, of points. And on the other hand, there are numerical models. They have the advantage of uh, being able to be immensely complex, but they are typical by being solved, what to say, uh, for specific inputs. So typically we have, whatever, um, stress mechanics or fluid dynamics, or we have neural networks. The neural network is a system of equations solved or optimized for given input. So it has all these properties of numerical models. And uh, we've been building models for quite some time now. So there is, a, there is quite a few giants on whose shoulders we can stand. Let's put it that way. And uh, uh, George Box is one of them, uh, the person who, as I do understand, coined the phrase of uh, all models being wrong, but some of them are useful. So let's see what are the uh, useful ones. And I, I would like to give you three examples for manufacturing industry. Uh, first would be the production process modeling. That's like the holy grail of what we want to do. Then let's go down to specific operation. And then I would like to call um, 
for the utility, I would like to emphasize the utility of uh, simulation environments. So the process modeling. In uh, the ideal case, we would have a model or, or general knowledge how the final operation of some production process would end up if we know what comes in. That's actually the definition of production process. It is something what is changing the inputs to outputs. So theoretically, if we know the inputs, we should be able to model the outputs. The reality is that there is seldom such knowledge. And these models are extremely rare. Uh, there is a pursuit, obvious pursuit, to find them, but it's really difficult. It's not easy at all. Um, and one thing which I would like to emphasize here is that it's not just uh, the function in the middle relating the inputs to the outputs. It is all the thing around it. And there is a pretty nice article um, called Hidden Technical Depth in Machine uh, Learning Systems, uh, which I've been pointed to by Jan Kleindienst. Uh, and uh, it actually says that the required surrounding infrastructure is vast and complex. And by that surrounding re uh, infrastructure, we mean all the manipulation of the data, all the cleaning, actually collecting them, uh, and all these tedious and uh, boring parts to get down to a data set on which we can actually have the fun. So if you didn't know what the F uh, means in Y equals F of X, the F is for fun. So that's one point. And then uh, the data which comes into all of that from all the sides is uh, burdened with several particle problems. The data never speak for, for themselves. That's a thing to remember. That's a thing to always remember. It is always, um, the, the interpretation is inevitable. The data always need uh, competent interpretation. And while being competent about the interpretation, the competency is here uh, um, denoted by the domain knowledge, we need to keep in mind that all the data have a measurement uncertainty. So even the signal which comes to the measurement, measuring stations or uh, probes or uh, whatever is burdened with that uncertainty. If something comes in, we don't know yet if it indicates some problem or if it is business as usual, something where we would like to coin the terms, not to coin, but to borrow the terms physiologic and pathologic findings, and even the data that come into the measuring machines that burden them with the measuring uncertainty have a signal and they have a noise. So if for nothing else, then for these all three constants, we need to be careful about which data we use to train our models. And the other typical problem for data in the manufacturing industry is uh, extremely unsymmetric learning sets. So essentially, we want to find out whether the set of input variables coming into the process would result in a not OK part, a part not conforming to specification in the end. And uh, the production processes are not designed to produce 50-50 percents of OK and not OKs. It is already pretty good. So like, if we use that as a learning set, there is a very little portion of those not OK parts to learn from. So quite typically, all the naive approaches to machine learning and modeling in general will produce something like 98% accuracy. And that's just because they would say 100% is right, and there will be just 2% of those not okay, and that would be the inaccuracy of the modeling. So, like, these models are useless. We know that, 
we need to be aware about that. So naive modeling really does not work on data sets that, is, that are at our um, disposal. All right, so that's for the few notes, just few notes for the process modeling, and let's get down to a particular operation. And I would like to demonstrate uh, that on um, screw tightening. So welcome to the art of perfect twist, meaning tightening the screws. Here again, oh, uh, one more thing. Uh, so this is uh, uh, a picture, a graph, of a screw tightening process. Uh, there is an angle on the horizontal axis and torque on the vertical axis. Uh, and quite interestingly, we have a, a picture to represent that. And this is something what we know already, like the GPT-4 can read pictures. So obviously, like, we have something to start at. And uh, we, again, can stand on the shoulders of the giants, in this case, Bertrand Russell, to go from data to information, and then from that information gain the knowledge. And this approach, this general approach, is extremely useful in this case, and we can break it down to individual steps that we want to walk through before we get to the knowledge. And yes, uh, let's use the advantage of having a picture, since it's worth thousands of words. So, uh, I have uh, two pictures here. One on the, on the left, one on the, on the bottom. And I have asked Google Bart to interpret what is on them. And uh, Google Bart, of course, can generate a thousand words for you and even more. That's what the picture is worth. And quite inter interestingly, the left one, that's uh, a wooden pole. The bottom one is a wooden stick on a top of a table. And the left one, quite interestingly, it says that it creates a sense of mystery and intrigue. And the bottom one uh, is a piece of ant tranquility. So that's the Google Bart interpretation. So why not to ask Google Bart or any uh, advanced system like that about the picture uh, from the tightening curves? Uh, I have put the stick on a table here again. Actually, as a matter of fact, one of these pic one, uh, this picture can transform into the other. I'll show you how. Uh, we start with the stick on a table. We just stretch it. Now it's completely abstract. You cannot see anything on this picture. It says, says nothing now. And uh, now it's the wooden pole. Right? That's what we can read there. So if we would interpret the tightening curves like that, we can look at the curve as it is, and we'll have uh, the notion of peace and tranquility, and we stretch it in a part, and we have a mystery and intrigue. And the bottom one is just a stretched part of the, of the upper one. So obviously, uh, these pictures of the tightening curves get interpreted by knowledgeable people. They get interpreted by experts. And it really matters how you stretch these pictures so anyone can actually read them, and it depends on the stretch what different people will interpret. And one more thing, if it is a picture, it's a, it's a funny thing, because we know what approximately should be the ratio of the sides of the picture. We actually know that it's, it's a face of a, of a woman. But in many of the pictures used in, uh, made, of the data collected, we have completely different physical quantities on the different axes. So like, there is no ratio between the angle and the torque. 
the ratio wouldn't make sense naturally, but it produces pictures which are being interpreted. Uh, does it matter? Isn't it that with just the stretch, we would make the same, same interpretation and why wouldn't the chat GPT or any machine learned model just stretch it in different parts for different purposes? Well, it does. Uh, let's see uh, this simple example. If we want to extract features by approximating these pictures, the stretch really matters. This is um, an example. There are uh, the same data points on the ABC graphs, pair of data points in each of them, and the y-axis is stretched uh, compared to B. Uh, the A y-axis is reduced. C, it's extended. And uh, so we have two sets of data points. We want to approximate them with a line, and we want to see how good is that, in, uh, how good is that approximation. And even though it is just a stretch, if you would calculate some simple metric like sum of squares, in uh, the A picture, the sum of red squares would be more than the blue, and in the C picture, it would be the other way around. So like the stretch really matters where interpreting some features when we want to, when we want to have them. So with that in mind, uh, let's see at the, uh, let's, let's have a look at the scrutinizing um, process. So this is uh, the typical data we are given, and I will now walk you through the stages of the tightening. Uh, actually, I believe the first time, one of the first great time I've heard about this was from Ládě Jarosz uh, many years ago. So I will try to reproduce what you told me 15 years ago or more, or something like that. So the screw tightening starts with uh, just running, rushing the screw in, and uh, do I have a pointer? Probably not. Okay, so the first part, uh, first note that this is not a function, that the torque is not function of the angle, uh, in the beginning, uh, it rotates a little bit back before the screw, uh, bef before the thread catches on, and then it goes forward, and then there is that big jump, that's a change of uh, speed, and then it really rushes in, and then there is a change of speed again around those about 6,000 angular degrees, and that's uh, just before the uh, nice thing. Uh, will start to happen. Uh, so, like, uh, when the screw tightening experts look at this, they already are able to uh, say a few things about that. What we usually see is that among a thousand of curves, there is one which is completely off and looks completely different. So, for us, looking at the data, this would seem an indication of some problem. The screw tightening experts look at it and say, that's fine. Nothing happened here. That's okay. So, like the classification of what is uh, uh, rare, in many cases, is not the indication that it is bad. And that's the reason why we actually want to borrow the terms physiological and pathological for these cases. These curves that we try to classify are all deemed okay by the tightening machines, but they are strange in some way. They're really strange and really rare in, in some way. That does not mean they are indicative of something wrong. So these we would call physiologic. So let's zoom out and now let's zoom in the final part. So now it's intriguing and disturbing. In many cases, we have the indication from the tightening machine on what is the last step of tightening, so we have the information that this is coming from some specific uh, part of the tightening procedure. And we can start looking at different features. So, uh, theoretically, when the uh, torque increases, it pushes the parts 
of the material together, and then at some point of time, some point of angle, the screw um, starts to stretch, but still in elastic region. So there should be part which is a straight line where the torque is proportional to the angle. But is it, is it really there? Like, what, is, what are these knee points, the, these smooth transitions actually doing there? Well, that's because we are not observing just the material. We are observing all other parts around it. So, like, really, can we estimate the quality of the tightening if it is not just the screw, what is playing the role, but it, it is all the materials there? Maybe we can, maybe we can't. That's really a question. But let's say that we would identify a proportional region, and now the questions would come like, how long it is? And uh, one of the questions which is being asked is, like, where is the point uh, where the elastic transitions into the plastic? And the people know, uh, knowledgeable in, the, in, uh, in engineering, are looking for a point, but it's not a point, obviously it's a region. So now the screw tightening goes uh, uh, on and on with the angle, and obviously there is something is happening there. It doesn't end with the proportional part. Uh, here it's tightened for what's called a torque end angle, so after reaching, reaching certain torque, the angle is just pushed there no matter what the torque is. Uh, and it results in something what should be a flat part in, on the top. Theoretically, practically there is no flat part at all. And sometimes it's slightly decreasing because after the yield point, maybe you remember, the stress needs to be a little lower to achieve elongation. Uh, but many times it is still increasing like that, so uh, that's the reality. That's like the, that's the actual screw tightening, screw tighten joint. So where is the uh, where is the yield? Where is the yield point? Where no one really knows. We need to define it. And if we define something, if we standardize something, it actually means we don't know. We need to find a consensus of actually calling some things um, a point, a yield point. In this case, one of the definitions could be like. When we find those two lines, they have an intersect. If we project that inter intersect on the original curve, that's what we would call a yield point. So many of the things which we have here are matter of definitions rather than actual physical qualities of uh, the observed phenomena. And then we can go on and we can define some other parts of the tool of the curve. For example, this one, this steep part, that's also something uh, pretty much no one cares about. It is um, the stiffness of the tightening tool, which no one cares about. The tightening tool is usually okay, but what about if we can estimate the state of the tool during the tightening process? Maybe we can learn something about the tightening process. Maybe we can find an indication that it is going sideways and we can prevent the wrong tightening later. So there are quite a few features which are not being looked at right now, but I believe they are there. So we can go on with the, with the feature uh, search. What I have put there now is this uh, dashed white uh, curve. So let's take out the original data uh, and let's just have the distilled points of it. Let's have it an ideal kind of a shape and let's get parameters of that shape. Uh, and uh, this is pretty consistent with what we do, for example, in metrology. When we are measuring a diameter of a hole or a cylinder or anything like that, we assume there is a cylinder or there is a circle, why right? there is none in the reality, nothing of the kind in the reality. But we approximate the shape uh, with that geometric feature and then we can 
say what is the diameter of a circle, only on the idealized case. So why, why not in uh, this case just have some theoretical uh, feature, uh, theoretical approximation, and then let's find the parameters on that feature. So yes, all of that is saying that the feature extraction, I believe, is extremely important. And it is, uh, I would say, essential. That's the point where we can take the domain knowledge and project it to a data coming in to find the information. And then let's take the information and let's build the uh, advanced models, but not before that. And I know, I'm well aware that there is a discussion that maybe this feature extra extraction is too much, and maybe we will have advanced artificial intelligence tools that will do it without the need for actual technical or physical definition of these. But I am afraid we are not there yet. And if I um, am to make a prediction, I don't think this is something we can neglect at all. Like this is the problem of the picture being stretched in different ways. And we know that by the stretch itself, we can produce outcomes of absolutely different conclusions. So being at this, let's say we have the features and we can learn and we can already employ the AI-inspired models to classify all these curves, but why not take it one step further? Why uh, don't we use the AI not just to classify the curves and do the mathematics and play with the numbers, why don't we actually play with the, with the user? So one of the things, one of the neat features that we uh, are demonstrating today is um, an AI assistant, AI chatbot, which can talk to you about the curves, about what, what is there. And uh, uh, now it opens the whole realm of where we want to take the AI. And maybe there are some areas where we don't want it. Maybe for just for now, maybe forever. We don't know that. But let's, uh, the, the, the optimism about the AI system is that they would potentially be able to make better decisions than humans because of the information advantage and the processing advantage and whatever. But how about we turn it the other way around? How about we keep the competence with the human and we harvest the comp competence of experts and we use AI to assist them. So like the task of sorting the data and looking for something unusual, that's the task for AI. And now we can have a AI chatbot like with the uh, language models, they are immensely great. They are just wonderful. So let's use them as somebody who speaks to the experts and harvests the knowledge of the experts. So like the final decision stays with the human and we have, an, we have a system to assist them. And there will be a guided tour uh, at four o'clock, you are most welcome to join. Okay, so this concludes the second part and the final, in the final part, I would like to speak a little bit about process simulation. And uh, quite a few things have been already said about that and quite nice work done by the Fraunhofer Institute on, on that front. Um, I still believe the immense utility of process simulation is undervalued. And uh, okay, let's make a little change of view here. It seems that there is a, uh, and uh, as Olaf has said in, in the morning, there is a gap between the production people and the IT people. And the IT people, let's call them the AI people now, and the production people would be those actually doing something in, on the shop floor, and there is a gap between them. Uh, the gap is real, the gap, the gap is obvious, 
And it seems like that these AI people are trying to sell something to the people on the shop floor and saying, hey, look at this, this may be interesting for you, this may bring you some value. Um, but how about we change that? How about it should be the task for the production people to build AI systems that are useful for their job? Why don't these people engage and start the discussion on what would be useful for them, what, what type of domain knowledge they want to keep because they don't believe it is, it, it can be abstracted, and what would help them, what would be actually the, the utility they would, they would welcome in, the, in that regard. Um, and uh, let's say that then these people are the creator of the AI world. So I think it is actually something the production people should take on themselves, the creation of the AI world. It should not stay with the IT departments. It is the tool for them and by them. And in the production processes, uh, of course, the modeling of the production processes, it's nothing new. Uh, it's going on for hundreds of years, maybe now. Uh, and quite typically, uh, the, it, it is a matter of defini definition what is a production process. So let's define it as, as, for example, the production line. Or something like production line. Uh, usually the modeling is fragmented into individual operations. So like there are experts for welding and experts for annealing and experts for injection molding and all these other uh, operations in the production line. And uh, it's obvious that one operation uh, influences the others. There is no question about that. But we don't really have that bridge for that gap in between the operation. So that's maybe something, um, I, I would actually say that's the second point. Uh, there is a real value in these conservative met methods. We cannot dispense with them. But maybe in bridging the gap in between them, there is the space for other methods. Be it, uh, should that be a machine learning? I think there is a great potential in that. Um, but if we push beyond the traditional methods, we lose the touch with what is right and what is wrong. There is a intuition, well, let's be frank about that. Most decisions are based in human intuition. They are not based in data. Maybe people read the data, they look at what is available for them, but then they make the decision based on, let's call it intuition, and let's, maybe that's an expert knowledge, but it's something in the human mind. So, uh, the machine learning systems, this is what they are good at. Mimicking the human intuition, right? So maybe they can mimic that as well. Uh, the problem is with the learning data set. If we change the way we approach problems, we, no, we lose the intuition of checking what is wrong and what is right. Because we are using completely different tools now. And that's uh, the point uh, where we can step in with a simulation of the production processes. And what I mean by that, uh, let's make a simulation machines that can generate data about the production process to test tools, possibly an AI-inspired tools, to control that process. And since we have extremely unsymmetric learning data sets, since the uh, production processes are uh, producing the non-OK parts once in a week or a decade or a lifetime, maybe there are such, <laughs> uh, then we need to generate 1,000 over lifetimes. So like, we are completely out of the scope of, of the data we can get our hands on to test the tools which may be available to us. So like that's, the, that's my point. 
we need to find tools to test the tools possibly being at our disposal. And let's make simulation for that. It's probably this, harnessing the best of both worlds, meaning the conservative and the AI, requires new tools for validation. Embrace simulation for the future of production. So to close, AI-inspired tools, I'm intentionally not using the term AI. I uh, appreciate we are not there yet, but we already have lots of AI-inspired tools. They are essential. They have immense utility. We can already have the value from using them. So let's not dispend them. Let's not come back. We are already over the Rubicon. The role of competence has not changed. We still need the domain knowledge. We still need the competence to develop these systems. And uh, what I like to say, the higher is the domain competence, the greater is the utility derived from these tools. It's not that these tools would be in the place of the domain knowledge. They are extending uh, the domain knowledge. Let's not forget that the data never speak for themselves. They always need interpretation at the right context by an expert, by domain knowledge. And for the decision making, we'll probably forever be stuck with uh, decisions grounded in intuition. But let's uh, acknowledge that this uh, intuition is refined and informed. It's intuition by people who know what they are doing. But if we change the context, if we allow new tools in, we need to inform and refine that intuition to the newly available information. Thank you very much.